Welcome to SciGest, your fortnightly serving of digestible science from plant and food research. Kira, and welcome to SciGest. Today, you'll be joining me, your host, and two of our scientists, Susie Black and Louise Craigting, to learn all about the new flume tank that's about to be commissioned here in Nelson. This new flume tank is New Zealand's largest, and it will enable scientists from plant and food research and beyond to test and develop new technology in a simulated open ocean but controlled laboratory setting. After this podcast, you can find heaps more information and photos of it on both our podcast info site and the Flume Tank website. So join me and let's dive in and learn more about Flume Tanks, what they are, and why this project is so exciting. So Susie and Louise, welcome to SciGist. We'll be hearing from each of you throughout the podcast, so thank you for being here. Thank you. We'll start with Louise now, and the first question really is what is a flume tank? Okay, so a flume tank or a flume is actually an artificial channel for water. They're designed, they're generally raised sort of above some level and they've been used in the past for like transporting logs, for example, a river system. What we actually have here in plant and food is actually a racetrack recirculating flume, so the flow rate has been moved around in a circular fashion and it's driven by four motors that are attached to a propellers and the four of them work together and we can create a range of different velocities starting from 0.1 meter or 10 centimeters a second right up to 1.5 meters a second. To sort of help our listeners along, does it work in kind of the same way as those like treadmill swimming pools? Very similar to those. I mean, it depends on on the mechanics behind how it's driving the flow rate. So ours is, like I said, it's a racetrack flume, so it's actually creating that circular motion. Uh, Some flumes actually have like a header tank, so the water will continually be brought into the system. Some systems have it that it goes actually under the floor and then brought back, but it's all motorised. It's been driven by mechanics to drive that flow of water. Cool. Super interesting. What are the various parts and sections in the flume tank? So basically the recirculating flume tank has three or four sections, if you like. There's the area at each end of the flume which turn the flow so that it all goes around the circular area. We have the obviously the propeller side of the flume, which is where the speed that they're turning at will drive the flow. And then we have, as they come around the flow straighteners, there's basically a big test section. And that was the whole point of this flume was developed so that we could trial different sorts of large items in the flume because the actual test section is five metres by 0.8 metres. And in that area, it's very sort of laminar flow or very similar flow rate. But the actual area itself in that section of the flume is 6 metres by 2.8 metres deep and 4.7 metres wide. So it's actually quite a large test section. The actual length of the whole entire flume, if you just in one area, it's uh, actually 15.5 metres long. So it's a very large flume and there's quite a large test section, but that was specifically designed that way to test sort of things like, as we'll discuss further, trawling gear, also aquaculture structures, so in a more realistic conditions. And out of curiosity, how many litres of water does that hold? It holds approximately 190,000 litres of water, and it's a freshwater tank, so um, it's not salt water, it won't be uh, used for anything biological, it's purely for sort of mechanical items. No fish are going to be put into the flume there. Okay. So. And no humans are swimming no, in it either. <laughs> well, not at this point. But I mean, potentially, I mean, if there are, you know, like you said, the swim tanks, people do trial things like um, swimming gear. So, you know, who knows? But at this stage, no, that's more designed for aquaculture and wild fisheries work. So Susie, can you tell us what we use a flume tank for? Well, we've um, developed this flume tank as, as a giant test tank. So the whole point is to be able to have a facility where we can rapidly prototype and test things. So it's an, prototyping is a really iterative process. So if we've got a, something that we can try things out in, so if you can put your prototype in a test tank and visualise it and test it, and then if you need to change something, you can quickly take it out again, change it, put it back in. And you can do that over and over again fairly quickly without having to have the expense of field testing. So it's a, it's a really great facility to be able to really push your research along quite quickly. Yeah. So it sounds like it's a little bit more convenient than having to jump in a boat every time you have oh, to test Oh, absolutely. Things. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about the weather too much either. Yeah. 
And I guess if you're worried about testing your equipment in specific weather conditions, you can do that as well without having to wait for it. Yeah, so um, when we're in that prototyping stage, it's really about understanding what the flow's doing around your structure or, or whatever you're testing. And so it's really controlled conditions. Um, so it's not necessarily the real world as such, but it's uh, it's that step before going out into the real world. So you've got, as Louise was talking before, you've got laminar flow. So you've got really even flow that you're testing in. It's really consistent. You can change change the flow, you can ramp it up and down if you want to, or you can hold it at a constant speed, but you've got all that control there that you don't necessarily have out in the real world. Yeah, that definitely sounds really valuable, but it also makes me wonder, I guess, what's the benefits of doing it in a flume tank versus just computer modeling because it has all these advantages where you can also just change things a little bit and oh, test absolutely. it. absolutely, but there's, really there's nothing like, it's that validation side of things. So yes, you can do all that computer modeling, but it's not until you build a model out of you know real live materials, even though it may not be full scale, it, you scale all the materials to that full scale prototype. And so once you actually get it into the flume and you can visualize what it's doing, that's incredibly valuable. And sometimes modeling isn't quite the same as the real world and that's that's where the value of flume tanks really is and it's that as I mentioned before it's that in-between step between going out into the real world if you can iron out all the kinks of your prototype all the all the little quirks in the flume tank before you go out to the real world then that, that's a huge time cost saving as well so it's yeah it's super valuable so yeah I think we've seen that a flume tank makes life quite a bit easier for testing and for doing science and research. What are some projects that you're most looking forward to introducing into the new flume tank, Susie? Yeah, we've, we've been waiting for this flume tank for a wee while, Julie, because we used to have a smaller flume tank at our old building back at uh, Wakefield Key in Nelson. It was a smaller flume tank, but again, equally as handy as the one we have here, being able to do that iterative prototyping process. Back then, we were working on a project called Precision Seafood Harvesting, where we developed the modular harvesting system, which was a change to the cod end of a conventional wild fishing trawl. So we did actually a lot of model testing in that small flume tank prior to going out to full scale on trawlers. Uh, So this isn't our first flume tank. We know how useful they are and we've had to wait a a few years to get our new flume tank. So we haven't had that facility for a wee while now. So yeah, we're really, really excited to get back in there. Uh, Another project that we're in the middle of at the moment is called Reimagining Aquaculture. So that's looking at turning aquaculture on its head and looking at some different fish enclosure structures for carrying out aquaculture and in particular having mobile fish enclosures and so yeah we're very very keen to put some models in the in the tank and test those as well just to start understanding or more understand the flow around them and different water velocities and so we can make some further progress uh, with those prototypes as well. Yeah, and I think the last time we spoke, we spoke about the open ocean Absolutely. aquaculture. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it's really so, cool to have that link <laughs> yeah. back. I didn't kind of realise I'd have you back here that soon, <laughs> but it's nice to chat again. Actually, that's similar to Susie. So I'm working also on the reimagined aquaculture. So I'm working closely with our the engineers, the CFD modellers. So they're developing like the different designs and dif- different shapes, different designs of the the structures, and then we can see which one we like the most or which one will be probably most um, useful and then actually develop that into the actual models size itself to be able to test in the flume because that's the whole sort of the reiterative process you develop the CFD model then you pick which one you know what you think is going to work then you validate it you create the model put it in the tank test it but then if we want to make any modifications you can go back to the CFD and try and make changes to it then you can put take it back into the flume again so you you can carry on doing this but it's a lot less cost obviously than if you were to build the full scale prototype and trial it out in the field so yeah we've got a lot going on shortly it would be it's really cool to be able to you know get into the flume and actually trial different projects we've got going so obviously trawl gear sort of developing further different MHS systems mm. and then we've also got obviously reimagining um, the st- structures but yeah the the flume is greater than that at the moment there's a lot of other applications for the flume that we can see is also for like robotics for example so testing the electronics the movement of like underwater rods for example but in a flow environment which you 
you know, it's a bit more difficult to go out in the field and trial these here, at least, like Susie was saying just before. It's in a really nice controlled environment, so you can change the flow rates. It's, it's not wet and rainy, and, you know, you don't have to worry about the waterproofing of your components above. Um, it's just the stuff that you put into the flume itself. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different applications and yeah, some really cool projects to be looking forward to working um, in the flume with, yeah. And I guess it's a bit more comfortable for the scientists as well now that you mention it. That <laughs> Very you can much just so. stay indoors. Much, and much so. So yeah. there's a key element that's really important for doing work in a laboratory. It's very controlled. So everything is able to be controlled. When you go out into the field, you haven't got that luxury. So especially for experimental design, developing prototypes, for example, having that control in an environment is critical, and especially and matching that or validating your models, your CFD models that you've actually created in the first place. So those two are, are quite key. And then when you feel really confident, you know that the product you've got is going to work well, then you can upscale and build the actual prototype and go out into the field with it. So flumes, um, these types of facilities have you know, used all around the world for this particular reason because it is a controlled environment. I have two questions that are probably a little bit naive. Uh, the first one's very straightforward. Probably, what is a CFD model? Oh, sorry, a computational fluid dynamics. Okay. Um, it's all mathematical equations, but basically you're characterizing flow around an object. So you'd put in an object, and that can be whatever design you like. So it can be any kind of structure, anything physical. You can put into these computational fluid domains, what they call. And then uh, you have basically a mesh around it. And then you, you can calculate the flow rate around the entire structure, but not just, you know, at the fluid solid interface, but also further out or um, within the st structure as well. So like, for example, if we were to put trawl gear in, you can actually create a whole file that looks exactly like the trawl gear. And then you run the CFD, uh, run a model for the different flow rates that you're interested in. And then you can actually see, depending on, like anywhere along the trawl gear and further, you know, out away from it or within it as well, what the flow rates are like. And also looking at things like, you know, what are the pressure areas, you know, what's the pressure like in different areas if you're wanting to change or manipulate the shape and size of the trawl gear, for example. Okay, that does sound quite complicated. Um, <laughs> but do you often see a lot of differences between this computer model and then the real life testing has there been in, anything in the that, yeah has there been anything that's really I guess surprised you uh the CFD actually models tend to be quite accurate to the model itself the interesting thing is the models are only as good as the information that you put into them as well so there can be sometimes some limitations one of the key limitations we do have is flexible modeling so the structures, for example, are they move, they're, the materials, they're flexible. Whereas when you have a rigid solid surface or rigid structure, it's a lot easier to model and your numerical model will probably be more accurate. So there are some limitations, but in general, you develop it in the CFD, there's a lot more capability with the CFD model. So if you know that the CFD model is behaving well, and you know that your model is also behaving well in the flume, you can do those reiterative processes knowing that actually what you're developing is actually going to be, you know, you can scale that up to, to trial it out in the in the field later on. So it's a reiterative process, but generally yeah. the CFD models, if you've got a good model, it's a very robust tool as well as the modelling and as well as the flume tank. So yeah. between the two of them, yeah, it's really robust to be able to develop something that you know is going to work out in the field because it's too costly to just go out in mm -hmm. the field and mm -hmm. trial things oh. at full scale. Just stepping back to the modelling piece around um, CFD, that's actually allowed, before we got into the flume tank, that's actually already allowed us to go through a whole bunch of different iterations of prototypes, sizes, shapes, dimensions, you know, all, all sorts of different things. Tried all sorts of wild and wacky things before settling on a couple of key designs to build as scale models for the flume tank. So again, there's that kind of whittling down of, of your ideas to the core ones uh, and then getting to the flume tank and then you kind of whittle them down again before you go out into the real world and build that full scale model. 
been really fortunate in the research that we've been doing over the last sort of you know 20 to 30 years. Plant and Food has invested a lot in this area of research in seafood technologies and the flume tank is just one of those investments and it's a significant investment. This cost two million dollars to build so it's you know it's not just something that you think about hey I'd really like a flume tank and whip off and build one on a weekend. This has been years in the making. We talked about before our old flume tank at Wakefield Quay. Uh, that was actually done on a, on a real shoestring. Uh, we pretty much built that ourselves. But this is, you know, larger, with a little bit more control. A huge investment by plant and food. And then something that, you know, Louise and I really, really appreciate because it, it then allows us to do some really impressive research in it. We've heard a lot now about what we can do with a flume tank and what we hope to do with our new flume tank here in Nelson. But how do you even decide what you want in a flume tank or figure out how to build it? Previously, the the industry we've worked most in over the last sort of 10, 15, 20 years has been the, the wild fishing industry. So trawling has been a big focus. And so we've done a lot around trawl gear. And so a lot of the specifications came from there. So how fast does a boat normally trawl at? And so we break that down to, okay, what size can we actually make this flume? You know, what are the actual physical dimensions of of the uh, building that we can put it inside? And so that brings in limitations and that tells us from there, how big can we build those scale models that we need to build? And so then we can scale the flow to match the trawler. And so that's where a lot of the specifications have come from, particularly around water flow. So as Louise mentioned, you know, we can go from zero right up to one and a half metres per second. And so that gives us a really great scope for being able to test things at, if it's uh, trawl gear at different trawl speeds. But it also then equates nicely to being out in the real world and just the, the currents out in the sea. So with the testing we've been doing for reimagining aquaculture, the sort of the prevailing current out there is around 0.3 meters per second but it can get up to as fast as 0.6 meters per second so we're well within that range of the specifications of the flume tank but that's where those specifications actually came from is from the real world. Do you have any comparisons to put those flow rates in context of speeds of things that people might know? Oh gosh, I think I've if, if you're probably you, isn't fair. that's okay. <laughs> I think if you a lot of people probably if you you can imagine if your stride is around about a meter long and you're yeah. taking one step per second, that's a meter per second. It may not seem particularly fast if you're just walking. You think, oh gosh, that's not that fast. When you actually see that flow, or if you are standing in a in a river you know, one metre per second, that's relatively quick. And the key there is the volume of water. Like our flume tank is four metres deep and it can go at one and a half metres per second. That's a heck of a lot of water it's moving mm-hmm. when it's going one and a half metres per second. You've got that mass of water. It's uh, pretty powerful. Yeah. I was just going to say the uh, another way of looking at it is I generally couldn't swim a, against a, one, a 0.3 metre, 0.4 metre current. So general rule was if it's under that, we can, you know, I'm a diver. So if it was under 0.3 metres a second, you can you can dive comfortably, but anything above that and it becomes quite strong. So even at half a metre a second, which doesn't sound like it's very fast, but actually in the marine environment, half a metre is actually a good flow speed. Just a normal current around our coastlines would sort of be in the vicinity of about 0.1 metre a second. Um, some areas it depends on the morphology or the the topography of the land, but you have um, a changes in. You, you could get up to 0.5. There are some regions in the world, obviously, that you can get very high flow rates, but would be areas where actually the the renewable energy industry would actually start looking into. So flow rates above one meter to two meters a second, which is very fast. We get one and a half metres, which is more than sufficient for a lot of the research we're going to be doing in the tank. So I think we've heard a lot about flume tanks and what they are and what we're hoping to do with them as well. And I have one more question for you, Louise. And I was hoping that we could hear a little bit about what makes this particular flume tank at Plant and Food Research so special in New Zealand. The flume tank at Plant and Food Research that's just been developed is a phenomenal facility. The flume tank's the largest in New Zealand, especially with this range of speeds. Um, There are other flume tanks sort of similar size in Australia, but very few, and of course you would have to go to Australia then to trial it. So 
in general, you know, there are a number of flumes around the world, but they're very far and few, especially at this size. So this here for New Zealand is really special. It's a really good facility to trial different technologies as well. So not just for the wild fisheries, not just for aquaculture, but also we're moving into an area as well where people, you know, starting to think about, you know, what kind of robotics can we use for even cleaning up the oceans, for example. And so they need to test that in an environment that is quite similar to the same kinds of currents that you would experience out in the open ocean. So this is the kind of facility that people could come to. So yeah, it's pretty special. It's just We've been talking about the wild fish and, and fishing industry and aquaculture industry, but I'm, I'm sure there'll be listeners out there thinking, man, I wish I could test such and such in, in something with you know constant flow. So yeah, please please get in touch with us. Check out our website um, and you'll see the specifications there for the flume tank. So if you think that's something you'd, you'd be interested in pursuing a little bit further, please get in contact. Yeah, I think it's really exciting that this is going to be open to anyone that wants to use it. Uh, so thank you so much to Susie and Louise for your time today answering my questions and teaching us more about flume tanks. And thank you so much out there for listening. Remember, you can find more information about our new flume tank in the episode description, which includes our linked website. On the website, you can find photos and videos and also contact information for if you'd like to know more about our flume tank or even about using our flume tank. If you haven't already, feel free to subscribe to SciGest on your favorite podcast listening app, leave us a review, or even recommend us to your friends. Until next time.